Welcome back to Mustang Physics. Today's topic, the second rule of magnetism, also known as Faraday's law of induction. If you haven't watched uh, the video we linked to Veritasium, go watch that first, then come back. Now, what I've got here in my hand is a compass. You've already seen one of these. It's just a small, uh, lightweight magnet that's free to rotate. And I've got uh, another magnet, just a neodymium magnet on the end of a long bar magnet that are joined together as one. And of course, uh, they affect each other. So this is the south pole of the magnet that's uh, away from my hand. I'm holding the north pole of this magnet since the north pole of the compass points at the south pole of the magnet I was holding. And this is a loop of wire, lots and lots and lots of coils, and it's connected back by wire to a DC power supply. There it is. So it's going to supply DC current uh, by applying a DC voltage to this coil. And you can see that when I bring it near, it doesn't really affect the compass until, maybe you can hear in the background, the fan of the DC power supply, once that's turned on, now you can see all of its lights are fired up. We've got a green bulb here, which means we're applying an amount of voltage to this coil that the power supply can handle. Um, now there's current running through that wire and that makes that into an electromagnet. And now you can see that the compass reacts to the presence of that magnetic field made by the current in the wire. Now, neither of those things that you just saw have anything to do with the second rule of magnetism. They are the first rule of magnetism. Moving charges create magnetic fields. But we're gonna use those today in the demos. And I wanna make sure you recognize that those two devices are things that you should already recognize. All right, let's uh, turn the power supply off momentarily, we'll bring it back later, and let's bring in a different loop of wire. Now this loop of wire is hollow on the inside. You can see right through it, and it's got a lining of plastic, and that plastic tube has a bunch of wire wrapped around the outside. These wires lead simply to a voltmeter with no power supply connected. So really important that you recognize that if we measure any voltage here, that it was generated uh, by whatever happened around the wire, not generated by a power supply. So Faraday's law of induction, or what we call the second rule of magnetism, is simply that a moving or changing magnetic field causes charges to move. In other words, you can cause current. Of course, you need voltage to cause current. So one way to do that is to have another permanent magnet. So we'll bring back our friend, the neodymium magnet. And you can see that when I put it near the coil that I get a little blip of voltage, very small amount, I've got this set to 200 millivolts. So we're only getting uh, maybe one or two millivolts worth of electric potential there. But of course, if I put it inside the loop, it's closer to all of the wires. Distance really matters in the world of magnetism. And you can see each time I move it, I get a little bit of a burst of voltage. Now you might notice that when I move the magnet out, I get a positive voltage. And when I move the wire in, I get a negative voltage. So the direction of the movement of the magnet affects the direction that current would flow in this wire because it affects the direction of the voltage. It's like reversing a battery. Now, notice that when I move the magnet, we get a little burst of voltage, but if I take the magnet and I simply set it inside, but I don't move it, our voltage goes back to zero. This is why it took Faraday a little bit of time to recognize how to make electricity from a magnetic field. It's not enough to just have a magnetic field. You've got to have a moving or changing magnetic field to create current in a different unconnected loop of wire. And that's the key. These aren't really physically connected. It's the changing magnetic field that is washing over the wire that's actually driving the current in the wire and we're picking up a voltage because you can't cause current without causing a voltage. So let's take this one out. It's interesting, the permanent magnet, and bring back our loop of wire that's connected to the DC power supply. Now, if you look closely at this, you can see that this is covered in plastic. So again, these are not connected electrically they're connected magnetically. Now I'm gonna nest these two inside of each other. And if I turn on the power supply, 
You see, right at the moment we turn it on, I got a little burst of voltage. And then if I turn it off, again, I get a little burst of voltage. So the power supply, remember, is only running current to this wire, which turns it into an electromagnet while the power supply is on. However, if I turn it on and leave it on, I don't get any voltage. And the reason I don't get any voltage is because I have a magnetic field around this current carrying wire, but that magnetic field isn't changing. And that is the key to the second rule of magnetism. You must have a changing or moving magnetic field. Now, I could crudely move the loop back and forth just like I moved the, moved the magnet. And even though the magnetic field around the wire is steady by moving the whole loop, that moves the magnetic field and thus we generate a current and a voltage across this wire. Now, how does that apply to a generator or to a microphone? For that, let's flip to the next page. If we want to talk about how a microphone works, we'll try and zoom in here just a little bit and let's turn the power supply off so we've got a little bit less background noise. When we talk about how a microphone works, one of the things that you'll recognize is it looks a lot like a speaker in its design. And it is. It's got a small coil of wire. That coil of wire is nested in a magnet. And that coil of wire would be attached to a cone shape. Now, the difference is that when sound comes in, sound comes in as a series of vibrations that vibrate air molecules forward and backwards. That means air molecules next to the cone would push the cone in and then bounce off and the cone would vibrate back. And then that process would repeat every time that the air molecules vibrated in and out and in and out. What that means is we'd have a magnet surrounded by a coil, uh, surrounding a coil of wire, and the coil of wire would be moving inside of that magnet. Well, <clears throat> if we've got a wire moving inside of a magnetic field, we should be able to develop current. Here's another demo. This is an ammeter with loops of wire, and it reads there when there's no current. And if I bring the magnet nearby and nest them together, you see that little blip of current when I first put the magnet in. But if this were vibrating because it were attached to a microphone, you can see that as that vibrates back and forth, even though the magnet sits still, we get a little deflection of the needle. Now, I do want you to realize that if I did that without the microphone, the needle does not deflect. It's only because it vibrated, because it went back and forth over the magnet that the needle deflected. What that means is when you speak into a microphone, the pattern that the cone vibrated in and out and in and out is captured electrically on the outputs of the wires that are attached to this voice coil. If we made a graph of positive voltage versus negative voltage, if someone's saying, ah, and their vocal cords moved like this, as they did so, that would cause the cone to move in that pattern, and it would cause current in the wire to follow that pattern. And so we would get an output that looked just like it but it would be an electrical signal rather than the motion of our vocal cords. That electrical signal could go to an amplifier to get taller, in other words, to carry more power, and then to a speaker so we could make the same noise, but louder. But it's all possible because of Faraday's law of induction. The, the wire moving near the magnetic field creates current in the wire, and the direction that the wire moves determines the direction of the current in that wire. So there's another really important device that we use in uh, our modern society that involves Faraday's law of, of induction, the second rule of magnetism, and that is an electric generator. 
Now this slide should look to you a lot like a motor, and it is. A speaker and a microphone are physically the same thing. But electrically and magnetically, magnetically, they're total opposites. A speaker uses rule one. We put in electricity and we get out motion. A microphone, we, put, we use rule two. We cause a coil or a magnet to move near the other and we create current. Well, by the same token, a motor and a generator can be physically the same. However, they're magnetically and electrically opposite. Again, a motor uses rule one. We put electricity in and that causes a magnetic field and that magnetic field repels another magnetic field and we get motion. But a generator uses rule two. Let's talk about how it works. A generator always has some external way to physically turn it. Now, there are some handheld generators. You might have a flashlight around the house where it's got a little crank and that's how it lights up. And what's happening is you're turning either the magnets near a wire or you're turning the wire near some magnets. Faraday's law of induction works. P period, amen. The second rule of magnetism functions every time that there's a wire moving near a magnetic field. That generates current in the wire and that current can be used to power your light bulb. So generators have, are, occur on all sorts of different scales, little handheld like ones like that to drive a uh, little flashlight, but they're also used in regenerative braking in hybrid and electric cars. So in the hubs of uh, hybrid and electric cars is an electric motor that can also be a generator since they're physically the same. When used as an electric uh, motor, we'd put current into the wire that would create a magnetic field around the wire that repels the permanent magnets nearby and that force twists the tires and allows the car to start moving. Now if you step on the brakes in a car like that instead of putting electricity in the brakes lock the generator up so that the wheels being forced to turn with friction with the ground physically make the guts of the generator turn there's permanent magnets nearby and that creates current in these wires. That current goes back to the battery to re-energize the battery so you can reuse the same electricity again. That's one of the things that makes hybrid cars more efficient in the city than they are on highways. Now, you might have a little portable generator like this and it functions in much the same way. The electrical part is down here. And again, it's just coils of wire and permanent magnets and the gasoline motor provides the energy to force the twisting. Now, if you wanna make lots of energy, you gotta start with lots of energy. So a large generator at a power plant, this is a person right there. So that gives you some sense of how big this generator is. The generator is actually in this part right here and you can see it's half buried under the cement. And that's because there's so much force twisting it that it would literally flip the generator over if it wasn't increased, encased in concrete behind them. It's about a nine story tall building outside of this building that's a furnace where coal is burned and all of the heat from that is used to trap steam that uh, turns an impeller which is kind of like a propeller that turns this generator this is the size of a generator that makes electricity for a city like denver so microphones and electric generators are really important and useful uh, applications of that second rule of magnetism, also known as Faraday's law of induction. All right, hope you enjoyed this. See you on our next episode.